So we change subject again for our next presentation from Dr. Lydia Mosi, who you, you've already had partially introduced to you uh, from the University of Ghana. She's a senior lecturer and head of department in biochemistry. She did a PhD in Tennessee, and her research interest is in mycobacteria and ulcerans, the Beruli ulcer. And she's uh, researched that in many different ways, as I, as I found out looking through her CV. But you're going to hear more of this now. Lydia. Good morning, and I want to thank um, Cambridge Africa Day for giving me the opportunity to share some of the work that I undertook during my CAPREX fellowship and some of the progress we've made since um, that time. So um, a couple of weeks back, there was um, alarming headlines coming out of Australia about a disease called Beruli ulcer. And um, they were reporting that they had seen more cases of this disease, which is quite endemic in West Africa. So Beruli ulcer is a skin infection, and the bacterium that causes the disease is in the same family as the bacteria that causes tuberculosis as well as leprosy. Um, in Ghana and in Cote d'Ivoire, which are both highly endemic, there are about 150 people who are affected out of every 100,000 people that you count. And it's a cutaneous infection. It's not systemic. In other words, you only find it on the surface of the skin. Um, it leads to extensive tissue damage and um, the formation of large and very unsightly and unpleasant ulcers. And with that, I am giving viewers discretion um, because I have just a few images that are rather unpleasant. Um, it is non-communicable, which is great because you can't get it if you're in the same house with one person, and it affects all age groups. Some evidence in um, certain parts of West Africa have shown that children under 15 are quite more um, affected, but um, generally, um, age is not a determinant as to whether you get bruliosa, and there's absolutely no discrimination between sex. What we've seen in all our years of research is that there's a high um, incidence of endemic countries or endemic um, areas with uh, disturbances to um, the geography. So for instance, in Ghana, Bruli also is highly prevalent in areas where there have been sand mining or um, surface gold mining or anything that turns over the soil. So globally, like I um, alluded to earlier on, Bruli also is found mostly in the tropical regions. And as you can see from this map, all the countries that are colored blue or green, depending on how your eye will perceive it, um, are countries that are affected by Bruliosa, and Ghana is quite endemic. Australia is one of the outliers because it's, the con it's another continent that has cases of Bruliosa, although the strain that causes the disease there is slightly different and less virulent compared to the strain that causes disease in West Africa. So the disease has four main stages of presentation. It can either start as a nodule, which you see on the far right, or a plaque, which you see next to it, or sometimes it's just a large swelling. And either of these forms can easily break out into a full-blown ulcer. We don't really know what causes um, or how it's transmitted, so we, we haven't been able to, in humans, estimate time of infection to time of development into a full-blown ulcer. But in animal models, depending on the um, dose that you inoculate, within anywhere from six weeks to three months, you can get a full-blown ulcer. Now, what actually causes the, the disease is a small toxin which is made by the bacterium. It's not a protein toxin, it's a lipid toxin. And it's a toxin that has very weird properties because it causes everything from cell death to um, lowering of pain. So people who have Bruli ulcer actually do not feel any pain at all. So people can have ulcers that cover up to a third of their arm or a third of their leg and they still are not reporting it because it's painless. And we've shown in studies that if you just take the toxin alone and you use that as an inoculum, it's able to generate the ulcer. So you don't really actually need the bacteria, but just the toxin is enough to cause a disease. So how do we diagnose Brulee ulcer? Typically, you take a swab, which is the least invasive type of sample you can take, or you take a fine needle aspirate from an edema or from a nodule. And if it's a full-blown ulcer, you can actually take tissue. And we bring these samples back to the lab, and we either do microscopy. The bacteria stains very beautifully as a pink color, 
against the blue background, which is what we call an acid fast stain. It's very easy to do. You can actually do it at the point of care, but the problem is that it's not very um, specific because any other mycobacteria will stain the same way. Or you can do a culture, and the problem with that as well is that the bacteria takes at least 12 weeks to grow. Um, and if you are waiting for 12 weeks before you initiate treatment, that's a problem. We can also do PCR, where we look for certain genes that are unique to the bacterium that causes Bruliosa. However, the problem with PCR is that it has to be done in a, res in a highly resourced lab or in a um, reference lab, which again takes time to transport the sample before you get your results. Or you can do a histopath exam where you take a biopsy, again send it to a high resource lab, and the problem there is it just takes time to get re um, read, um, but you can actually see the pathology which is associated with Bruliosa. Now, up until about five years ago, the sole treatment for Bruliosa was surgical excision of the ulcer or the lesion. And it's excised into healthy tissue so that we can get rid of all the mycolactone, which is a lipid and, and lives very freely in the fatty acid, in the fatty um, layer. But uh, a couple of years ago, the WHO um, made a, a strong push for the use of antibiotics for the treatment. So currently we are using anti-TB drugs and they are ve very um, useful when the ulcer is noticed early and, and the treatment commences early enough. However, even when we have um, cases where we have to still do the um, surgery, antibiotics are used as a supplementary um, treatment. And so typically the wounds are debrided and they are dressed for sometimes up to six months, so the patient has to be hospitalized for this entire time. The problem with Bruliosa is that it's not a mortal disease. It's actually a very morbid disease. People always heal with, with uh, deformities, and there's a lot of stigma associated with the disease, primarily because it's not painless, and people don't even know how they get infected in the first place. So our problem statement is that, um, or was that, um, because of the painlessness and the stigma associated with the disease. There's a lot of delayed treatment seeking behavior amongst the communities that are affected. Um, and there's a huge underreporting. Actually, in my opinion, the news article that came out um, from Australia was simply because people went looking for cases and then they found them. It's the same thing in, in Ghana. When you go looking for the cases, you absolutely find them because people who are affected are in areas where there's not even enough transportation access, so people don't even, are, are not even motivated to go seek treatment. There's always a long distance from the actual communities where the disease are to where the, health, the nearest health center is for treatment. And so there's extreme late diagnosis, hence late treatment seeking behavior. So based on this, we thought of ways in which we can um, ameliorate this late diagnosis issue. So we looked at ways in which we can find newer biomarkers, biomarkers that come directly from the ulcers. These are metabolites, which we think that um, you can easily develop a point of care tool, which doesn't need too much technology or too much um, technical know-how to use. So we sought to start with a basic research approach, taking tissues or taking samples from people with Bruli ulcer and taking a closer look at the metabolite profiles that they have to see if there could be something that would stand out in people who have Bruliosa compared to people who don't have Bruliosa. So we asked the question that can we identify key metabolites that have extreme, extremely beneficial biomarker potential, which can be used as an early, um, as in the development of an early point of care diagnostics. So it's really simple. You get a patient with Bruliosa and a patient without Bruliosa, but also has a tropical ulcer so that we, we can actually um, get a clear or a be a, the best type of metabolite. Now, it's most likely that there'll be common metabolites amongst or across these two um, populations, but then there'll be a few that actually stand out in the BU people, and we can take that further on towards the development of a diagnostic. So here comes in the Capricks Fellowship, which I was fortunate to be part of in 2016. And it took a 10-week fellowship in the lab of Professor, Professor Julian Griffin um, at the Department of Biochemistry in the Sangam Building. And we performed a cross-sectional case control study, like I earlier on suggested too. We sought eth ethical clearance, and we, we 
obtained informed content from patients as well as demographic data and history of how long they had had um, the disease. And since it was a pilot study, we had quite few numbers. So we had 48 people with Brulee ulcer and 25 with other ulcers at different stages. So we either took a swab, a biopsy, or a fine needle aspirate, or sometimes both if we were lucky. So in Ghana, what we did was, after taking the samples, we took two sets of samples, one set that was preserved um, or frozen that we used to first confirm the case and run other diagnostics in, in, in our lab or in my lab. And then we, pre we preserved the others in methanol for which we performed extractions and then brought the samples over to Cambridge. And in Cambridge, we um, performed um, gas cryptography coupled with mass spectrometry to identify the metabolites using a library. And this here is just, again, no, not too much scientific detail, but just to show you that whether it's a swab or a biopsy, we're still able to recover key metabolites um, which were either water-soluble or um, not water-soluble. Now, this is a slide which you probably cannot read, but um, what I wanted to show from this is this is just a list of some of the metabolites that we identified. On the right are the water-soluble ones, and on the left are the, the fatty acid methyl esters. And just to show that there were key metabolites that stood out, um, which putrescine and cadaverin you can identify in um, decaying tissue. Um, naphthalene is quite odd, but it was very interesting for us to see it because it's probably something that was in one of the portulases that people use for their local treatment. And pyrazol was also something interesting that we saw. And so we did some statistical analysis to try and see if there is a difference between the metabolites we see from bruliosa patients versus non bruliosa patients. And for the water-soluble metabolites, unfortunately, we were not able to get a huge discrimination between these two groups. But for the fatty acids, um, it's not showing too well here, but um, in red are the metabolites that we were um, getting from the Bruliosa cases. And we saw that there was quite some clear distinction between BU patients and non-BU patients. And we, when we take a look at um, the metabolites, again, based on the infectious, infection status, in another representation, there were some key metabolites like oleic acid, as well as um, pyrazole, which again stood out in the BU patients compared to the non-BU patients. Now, when we looked at the sample type that we took, where there was a swab, because essentially we would want to be as, um, we want to be uh, less invasive as possible in taking the sample. So if we could rely on metabolites that came from swabs, that would be perfect for us. And we were able to show that indeed swabs, um, taking a swab and getting good enough metabolites from swabs was just as good as taking a fine needle aspirate or a biopsy, which are rather invasive. So for, for the Caprex experience, um, the few insights that we got is that it is indeed possible to identify metabolites that are unique to patients that have Brulee ulcer. So we thought this was really encouraging. Um, and we are also encouraged by the fact that the metabolites that we extracted from swabs were also um, good enough. And so we can indeed pursue this course to the development of a rapid um, diagnostic marker. So whilst I was here, I took advantage of all the other opportunities that Cambridge has to offer. Um, I attended a, a molecular phylogenetic course just to build up my knowledge. Um, uh, there was a fantastic one-day course that I attended on how to write an academic paper and get it published in 45 minutes. And it's, <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was very inspiring. And I've been talking um, to the director of work, Bib Gordon, about trying to um, introduce this concept to our students because the, this writing is just such a problem. <laughs> um, and um, other things that I did whilst I was here, Cambridge Beer Festival, absolutely amazing. <laughs> absolutely amazing experience. And my lab, the lab that I was in, was a really fantastic lab. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity that Cambridge um, Africa um, program office. So based on the data that we got from the preliminary work, um, my collaborator Jules and I put together um, a small grant, well, 
um, for the Global Challenge Research Fund under the auspices of the Medical Research Council. And our idea was to increase the sample numbers. I, do t I, I still do some work in Cote d'Ivoire where I did my postdoc, so I have the link there. And it'll be interesting to see what the metabolite profile in um, patients from Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana have in common and so on and so forth. And since we are going through the non-invasive route, it will be interesting to see what we can find in the urine of these patients as well and see if it's also a good sample to take um, for developing a biomarker. And we also wanted to look at the other, there are other uh, mycobacteria out there that also make this toxin, but have not yet been implicated in humans. So we wanted to include those in our discovery and also do further um, untargeted liquid chromatography in addition to the, mass, um, to the gas chromatography so that we can obtain a holistic discovery of biomarkers. So with, that, with the money that we got from the Global Challenge Research Fund, which we were successful, by the way, we have outlined the areas that we would want to work in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, and these are all communities that are endemic for the disease. We've already gone through the process of seeking eth ethical clearance, and we are not limiting ourselves to who we can get for the study. So we are looking at patients who are already hospitalized for the treatment of Brulee ulcer, or those who are undergoing traditional treatment as well, and those who are actually self-treating at home, because there are quite a few of those. And based on that, in December last year, we organized a participant recruitment workshop in one of the districts. And this is really essential because the reportage in Ghana is really low. Um, and you have to actually do active case surveillance and go into the communities to find the cases. Otherwise, you'd get all this money to do the work and you not even have one person coming in to report that I have Brulee and I want to be enrolled in this study. So we identified, the Ghana Health Service has a cohort of individuals who are called community health workers. And their role is to live in the hamlets, the hamlets that are almost inaccessible um, by cars, the hamlets where um, you have most of the farming communities and most of the people who come into contact with the environment through their daily work. And they live there and are able to report incidences or cases of diseases and advise the people to go and seek treatment. So we identified a cohort of these individuals, brought them to the Jacobu District Hospital with the aid of Tim, who I'm showing a picture of here. He's the district health director, very, very instrumental in making this thing work. And Jumo, who is sort of kind of like the lead technician in the area who has been taking Brulee samples for the National Control Program. And so we organized a training on how to take, identify samples and how to take samples and pre preserve them in such a way that the metabolites will not be degraded or be preserved up until when we come back to pick them or um, for processing. In addition, like I alluded to earlier again, most of these hamlets are inaccessible by car, so we were able to raise some funds and buy a motorcycle to facilitate um, Aquisidrum or to go and pick up the samples as and when they are reported. So we've set up a very neat system which the Ghana Health Service and the National Control Program for Bruliosa has really bought into, where these community health workers who live in the hamlets identify the cases. And when they identify the cases, they send a WhatsApp message to the district health directorate. And when we get five people who have been reported to in one specific community, Akwesi goes with a motorcycle and takes the sample because he's trained to do so and brings the sample back to the district health center. And we have a, a, a system where it is shipped by bus, one of the local transport companies, to our lab where we do the diagnosis and send the results back to them in two weeks. This is an innovation which the Ghana Health Service has really praised and are um, trying to institute this in other communities as well. And we bring the rest of the samples back to the lab and then we do the routine processing where we take, um, we keep them in methanol until further extraction and then bringing them back to Cambridge to do the final analysis on. So, so far we've obtained just around um, 60 samples from Ghana, and we are still awaiting the samples from Cote d'Ivoire to be shipped. And it's interesting to see that majority of the lesions that we are seeing are in category three, which is about 15 centimeters. So they are actually late stage ulcers, and we think that our active case surveillance is really working. In addition, um, 
we are hoping to finish the processing of the samples and then move this forward to seeing if indeed we can um, detect good or genuine biomarkers that we can use for the detection of really also. So having said all of this, I really want to thank the people who helped me do this work. So Jules has been really, really instrumental in letting me get interested in this whole area of metabolomics. I have traditionally been involved in transmission for at least 15 years now, but I'm excited about the opportunity that I'm getting um, through this metabolomic study. We have very strong partners in um, Cote d'Ivoire, Emmanuel Kaku and Ajay, who are both um, helpful in obtaining samples and helping the, and getting the samples to Ghana. And Steve Mer Steve Stephen Murphy here in Cambridge in Jules Lab is really the one who showed me everything um, whilst I was in Cambridge. He um, showed me how to use the mass spec and understand the data that comes out of it. And on the picture on the left are my small team of able body field workers who help going to look for the samples and so on and so forth. And that's a picture of my current lab group. And with that, I'd like to thank Caprex, the Alborada Research Fund, University of Ghana, WACBIB, for giving us all the support that we need, the Medical Research Council for the GCR grant, and finally, Santos Swiss, the research in, um, scientific in Cote d'Ivoire, where I did my postdoc and I still have active collaboration with. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, uh, admirably uh, uh, concise and interesting and, and packed. So we've got time for a few questions if people would like to ask them. Sorry, Alison Elliott from Uganda. I was just wondering, it's uh, very exciting. I was just wondering if you have plans to uh, be able to do the metabolomics in Uganda, in yeah. Ghana. <laughs> wow. Um, so th <laughs> this, this is a good question. And it's, can we do metabolomics in Ghana? Yes. The equipment that we need to do the metabolomics is a mass spec, which is a rather expensive and rather high maintenance. So it's something that we as WACVIB and the Department of Biochemistry have to really think about to see if it's just for this study or we can get a wider um, usage or patronage for it because it will be um, financially unwise to get a mass spec just to do this study. If we can get other people to buy into the idea of doing metabolomics work, absolutely. It's a, it's a great core equipment to have for the department. Um, and we can generate internal funds for it as well when people come to use it. Shona Wilson, University of Cambridge. I was just wondering whether you have any major things that you have to think about in terms of sample preservation in these rural areas to get them back in a, in a good form to do the metabolomics on them. Yeah. Yes, so in our first study, that was, those, that was one of the things that we um, learned, should I say learned the hard way, because for metabol metabolites have a very short lifespan. And so if you take them and you don't preserve them on time or well enough, you would not get quality or good data out of the work or out of the sample that you took. So this time around, we are preserving, we are taking three different sets of sample. One sample that we keep directly in sort of a, trans, a culture transport media so that we can still try and isolate the mycobacterium from the lesion. And then another one that we take and we preserve directly in ethanol, and that's what we use for our DNA extraction and further uh, downstream events. And for the metabolites, we immediately keep it in methanol. And when you put it in methanol, it stops all sorts of metabolic activity. And at the health center um, in Jakobu, they have um, a freezer where they are able to store the samples, and we ship them with dry ice by bus. And it takes, between Jacobu and Accra is about a four and a half hour journey, 
and we pick the samples directly from the VIPs or the bus station and bring them to the lab. So we've taken um, serious measures to make sure that we preserve the integrity of the sample. Thank you very much indeed, Lydia.